All right, we are live and we are recording. Thank you everybody for joining us tonight. My name is Sean Loggy. I'm the Advanced Hunter Education Program uh, Coordinator for the State of California Fish and Wildlife. And uh, tonight we're gonna be talking about waterfowl hunting and other opportunities at Grizzly Island and the Sassoon Marsh. Uh, we will be joined by a couple of uh, great ho uh, panelists and let me get to them. So tonight we have joining us is uh, Grizzly Island Area Environmental Scientist Orlando Rocha. I wanted to show you both uh, his work and his play um, uniforms because uh, Orlando is a duck hunter just like many of us who are joining here tonight. And he is also one of our department um, personnel. So you may see him in uniform or you may see him out in the field. Um, he grew up in the Sacramento area. He came from a hunting family, but they only hunted big game. Uh, but he did be, start uh, hunting waterfowl uh, at, at when he was about 20 years age, uh, when he was working with a friend that probably introduced him to it at the American River Trout Hatchery. Orlando graduated from Humboldt State in 2005 with a BS in um, wildlife management. That's a good job, good, good task. A lot of our department personnel has, have the same type of degree. Uh, he came to Sassoon Marsh when he, uh, to take a biologist job with a, uh, the Sassoon Resource Conservation District and help private duck club owners uh, improve their lands uh, for duck hunting. And in 2003, he uh, says came back because he did work uh, temporarily for other departments uh, or areas in the north um, prior to that. So he's been working with the uh, NGO partners, which is our non-government um, up operations and non-government, what does NGO stand for, guys? Non-government organizations. Organizations, there we go, thank you. And uh, improving Grizzly Island's habitat, and he really looks to excited for the next five years when they have a lot of four to $6 million to be spent on Grizzly's infrastructure and habitat. And I know Orlando's gonna try his best to, to uh, improve that for all of us. Um, we also will be joined by Carson Odegaard. I hope I said that right, Carson. Uh, Carson works with California Waterfowl Association and he's their hunt program coordinator. Uh, Carson has been running their program since 2017. He graduated from Chico State with a BS in biology and he began working with CWA within a week of graduation. He has a passion for the outdoors. As you can see, he's a waterfowl hunter and a big game hunter. And he likes to uh, help people get out onto the properties that uh, CWA is reaching out to private landowners and acquiring lands for people to have an opportunity to go out and, and enjoy our wildlife. So right now we always like to start with some polls so our presenters know uh, who they're dealing with out in our audience. And here comes the first poll. Also attached to the poll as a joke. I have been stretched thin for them. Hope you enjoy them if you find them funny. Let me know, otherwise, uh, you know, be mean. <clears throat> so here's your first poll. Have you ever visited Grizzly Island Wildlife Area? Yes or no? And the joke is, why did the grizzly get fired from his job? He was only doing the bare minimum. <laughs> I put some grizzly jokes in here, feeling we were dealing with grizzly islands, so I could get away with that. All right, that was a good choice. So I'm gonna close this in three, Two, one. All right, I'm gonna share the results with you. So 63% uh, of you have visited Grizzly Island Wildlife Area. So your interest tonight is good. You, you probably wanna learn a little bit more about it. And 38% have not been there. So there you go, Orlando, we have some newcomers to your area. And 92% found my joke funny. All right, let me go to the next poll. Poll two, here it goes. Have you ever hunted on Grizzly Island Wildlife Area? So this is a little bit different question. Have you ever hunted on Grizzly Wildlife Area? And the joke is the soccer player's son duck hunted in the mud all day. He was a little messy. You, you wouldn't know if that was funny if you didn't know who Lionel Messi was. Uh, but anyways, I tried. That's not even the way the joke went, I, I altered it to make it, make it fit. 
All right, so I'm gonna close the poll in three, two, one. I lost some re respect with the joke there. But here's the answer for, have you ever hunted grizzly wildlife area? Only 39% have said yes. So we have some newcomers. You got your uh, hands full tonight, Orlando. And 61% have not hunted it. So thank you for coming. This is exactly what we're trying to do to help you uh, get a little bit more familiar with the area and how to use it. So you're in the right spot. And then let me switch slides, one slide, and go to the last poll, California Waterfowl. Since we're being joined by California Waterfowl, which is a non-government organization that works closely with us, uh, here we go. Have you ever applied for a special hunt with California Waterfowl? They have a hunt program, which Carson will be covering. I'm just curious how many of you have actually uh, applied for a special hunt with their program. And here's the joke. What did one goose say to the other geese uh, to reveal his travel plans? The goose said, do you wanna listen to my migrate, to my great plan? <clears throat> I'm sorry. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Terrible, all right. What can I say? And here it goes, close it in three, two, one. All right, so, um, 31% have applied for California waterfowl uh, special hunts and 69% haven't. So maybe we'll help you out tonight, those 69% who haven't. They have a great program. Carson will tell you about it a little bit later. And only 56% found my joke funny. All right, oops, I wasn't sharing my results. There's the stats and here we go. All right, so you've got to know our uh, presenters. I'm gonna stop my screen share and I'm going to let Orlando Rocha, our environmental scientist from Grizzly Island take over this webinar. And any people who have any questions, please use the question and answer function. We will try to answer them uh, through there, either throughout the uh, webinar or at the end of the webinar. Uh, the chat function is just for a couple you know, comments. Uh, that you want to share, but that please use the question and answer function uh, so we can help you out. Okay. And once again, too, also I wanted to let you know is that any links that are uh, shared in tonight's uh, presentation and a couple others will be shared with you in an email that uh, will go out through the registration system you used uh, to join this webinar. So don't worry about any links, copy them down. Uh, I will be sending you out links that were used in the program at a, at a later time tonight. All right, take it away, Orlando. Right, thanks, Sean. <clears throat> so I, I'll start kind of on a broad scale for everyone since it seems like a lot of you haven't uh, hunted or been to the marsh itself, but little history. This is the grand scale of California. You can see we're right off the San Francisco estuary. And zooming in, uh, these are all of our units on that comprise Grizzly Island Wildlife Area Complex. Uh, the star in the middle there that is Grizzly Island Wildlife Area, that is our largest unit uh, at about 8,600 acres. And that's the one that most people would think of when they think of hunting on Grizzly Island. Uh, but we have several others that are available and we're gonna go through all of those and what type they are and, and the process to hunt them throughout this talk. But before that, um, so here's the general public use map of that area. This is what is available most times of the year. And this is a schedule. Grizzly Island is a, the complex is a multi-use area, meaning we are open different times a year for uh, all public uses, not just hunting and not just bird watching or hiking, but which really try and uh, combine all those uses. And that may be why some of you have been to the marsh before. Fishing is probably one of our most popular activities in the marsh. So you can kind of see that general public use is February through July. That's the time we are open for general nature viewing, bird watching, photography, hiking, that kind of activity. Um, 
fishing, like I said, is our most popular. It gets thrown into that time frame, but we also have from July to October fishing along a small section of Montezuma Slough, even during our uh, waterfowl hunt season. So, uh, and then dog training, we do allow dog training on the Wiley Ferry. You can even come and plant your own birds as long as you follow the regulations that go along with that. Uh, in the months of February and July. So that's that's something else that a lot of people take advantage of. And then of course the hunting that we're gonna talk about for this, uh, the majority of this talk. Waterfowl being probably the most common. Uh, we do have pheasant hunting, dove hunting, rabbit, uh, and then of course tule elk. The tule elk is a special permit draw. Uh, and we'll discuss that a little more. And then we do allow for falconry hunting in case anyone is, uh, interested in that. So <clears throat> since some of you haven't been to the marsh, I'm going to go ahead and give a little history on the Sassoon Marsh in general. So it is the largest contiguous brackish marsh um, in the U.S. or actually it's west of the Mississippi if I remember right. I think the Chesapeake Bay is uh, a little larger at this point. So it does uh, account for 10 percent of California's remaining wetlands. And in case you didn't know, brackish marsh, meaning it is the mix between the fresh water of the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers and the salt water of San Francisco Bay. So we are the mixing zone of, of that area. So when you do come to hunt here, remember to wipe down your gun afterwards because it is a little salty. So keep that in mind before you put it back in the gun case. <clears throat> so acreage breakdown. Like I said, it's a large area. It's 86,000 acres in total. Uh, 52,000 acres are managed wetland. Managed wetland meaning that somebody has the ability to put water onto the landscape and remove it at different times so that uh, basically we're trying to provide habitat by uh, farming different species of plants that the wildlife will use as food or for cover value or for nesting habitat. Uh, 6,300 acres of tidal wetlands, 30,000 acres of bays and sloughs, and 27,000 acres of upland grasses, which are important for nesting habitat, and we'll see a little bit in the future here. All right, so some Grizzly Island history. Uh, there is a long history of hunting in Sassoon. In 1859 was the first documented hunting mar uh, market hunting, and then by 1870 and 1880, uh, reclamation of land. That means that people were taking the landscape from a tidal habitat, just a regular bay and building levees so that they could keep the water out and then go ahead and farm. A lot of, uh, as you can see, sugar beets, barley, asparagus, there's still remnant asparagus populations in the marsh. So that's kind of a, a neat reminder of the past. The soil of Grizzly Island, because it gets sediment from the rivers is uh, pretty fertile. So that's why farming was a popular uh, part of, of the history there. Just some pictures here, early agriculture in the Eastern Marsh. The Eastern Marsh, since it's closer to the rivers would have been fresher in that point. Uh, some grain production. So really the Department of Fish and Wildlife starts its history on Grizzly Island or in the Sassoon Marsh with the purchase of Joyce Island in 1931. The, that was the first or the second waterfowl management area in the state to be solely bought for uh, waterfowl habitat and value. In 1950, the area that I showed on that map was, was purchased um, and it was also purchased uh, as a waterfowl management area. You know That was its main focus at the time. So the railroad, like in many other places in the country, played a, a vital role in Sassoon history because in 1859, construction of railroad began and some of the first duck clubs, uh, duck club owners or members were influential enough to get the rail line uh, moved instead of it being, if you've driven on Highway 680, which is up on the hillside to the west of the marsh, it's nice hard ground, but the rail line actually runs through the marsh itself. And it is very hard to 
maintain. But what that allowed is whistle stops for those duck club owners to come out of the city, mostly San Francisco, and they would stop at their duck clubs and be able to hunt. So access became much easier at that point for those clubs. So <clears throat> today there are approximately 150 duck clubs in the Sisseton Marsh, but the state is still the largest landowner at this time uh, with about 16,000 acres being owned by Department of Fish and Wildlife. And the majority of that is open to waterfowl hunting. Uh, so that's not a bad thing. So this stuff, basically there's a bunch of initiatives and acts that come through, but it really ends with uh, 1977, the Sassoon Marsh Preservation Act. It was basically the legislature said that the marsh was special enough to be protected and um, for future generations. And that's, we're lucky for that because the marsh has pretty much stayed untouched uh, in that time. And that's why we have large populations of, of um, endangered species and some other uh, fish and all that stuff because development was kept at bay. So again, the protection plan, uh, a lot of these species are here because of that. So right in the middle is the endangered salt marsh harvest mouse. Lower left corner there is a, a delta tule perch. So those species take advantage of development not being in the marsh. Here's some of our bigger species that uh, people see on a regular basis. You may see the tule elk pretty often when you drive out or uh, Western pond turtle, they're a species of concern at this point in California, but potentially could be listed, listed as uh, threatened and eventually endangered. So, uh, but in the marsh, because of the large landscape, they're doing uh, very well. Again, the salt marsh harvest mouse. And then another ground nesting bird that uh, we see quite often, and you'll probably see it year round, the northern hairy. So, like I mentioned already, the tule elk, if You've been to Grizzly Island, you've probably seen them. Tule elk are endemic to California, meaning they are only found in California. And they roam the Central Valley in historically. So Central Valley would have been redding to down to hatch fees. Um, and so some of the early numbers ranged at 500,000 animals in the Central Valley. Uh, that's from some explorer diaries. So some things happened in California, mostly the gold rush, but westward expansion. Basically, by 1860, you know, gold was discovered in 1848. By 1860, there were between two and 20 animals left in the state. So quite the decline there. Most people thought they were extinct. Uh, at that time, a cattle baron named Henry Miller uh, was credited with saving Tui Elk. He basically found the last few and them up and by 1914 was incurring so much damage as a cattle rancher that he came to the precursor of the department, the California Academy of Sciences and uh, managers put together a plan to establish 22 herds throughout the state. Uh, three were successful. By 1971, there was 500 animals in the state. And so a lot has been learned in relocating elk in that time and the department's gotten much better at it. And there are 22 herds in the state now and approximately 5,700 tule elk. And every single population or every herd is uh, increasing at this point. So on Grizzly Island, seven animals were reintroduced in 1977. And uh, at this time, we are, we are, this is about where we're at. We have around 220 animals. That's a, that's a goal and uh, we are pretty much right on the number at this point. So some of the other <clears throat> uh, science that goes on on Grizzly Island, in case you're interested, we work a lot with all these partners, but USGS has been doing some interesting research I wanted to show you. Basically, if you happen to harvest an animal like this, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, that is a basically a cell phone receiver mm -hmm. with a solar panel on it. And what it does is allow and this is a much smaller unit that can be placed on ducklings, sorry about that. But basically this allows for, you can see the movement of birds that are coming from Sassoon. So Sassoon you would think is a small area, but relative to California, 
but this and this next slide here, you can see how important it is to uh, waterfowl throughout the United States and also jumping over towards Russia and Japan. So pretty interesting stuff there. And a lot of these birds were caught on nests in our nesting fields. Uh, so you can see that they don't just stay on Grizzly Island, they make an impact in the world. All right, so at this point, we'll go ahead and get started with the actual ins and outs of, of Grizzly Island. So Grizzly Island wildlife area, the main unit is a type A area. If you don't know, a type A area is a large unit generally that has a staff check station, uh, has amenities like space blinds. On this unit, we have three different units, Pond 11, the Crescent unit, Crescent family, which is junior required. And we'll get into the, the, the specifics of a lot of this stuff. Uh, and we have three type B units that are hunted on a regular basis. Uh, Goodyear Slough unit, which is down close to Benicia, actually off Highway 680. The West Family unit, which is another junior required unit, where I will mention that the chaperoning uh, adult is allowed to hunt with the junior on both those, on both the junior required units. They just, you have to have a junior with you. Uh, type B is Island Slough unit, uh, just another free roam area that you can sign into and, and go ahead and hunt. So since we have some new hunters here, the gear list, this is the basics of hunting in Sassoon. You need your valid license and appropriate stamps, validations. Uh, chest waders, I would definitely recommend. You might be able to get away with some waist waders, but hip boots, I would say you're gonna end up filling up your, your boots at that point. Uh, shotgun with proper non-toxic ammunition and camouflage outerwear. That's kind of the basics of it. Some of the additional stuff, as you can see in the picture, um, you can bring along as much as you like and people do. So a uh, waiting stick to check for holes and cracks because it's no fun to take a spill in the cold morning. Material to make portable blinds uh, free, for free roam areas, a marsh sheet for the free roam areas. A lot of our blinds themselves have stools in them that are there for you. You don't have to bring a, a stool to the blinds themselves. Uh, decoy cart, which is the cart you see there, a jet sled to then float stuff out through the pond. And of course, assorted, assorted waterfowl decoys, teal, widgeon, shoveler. And then once you get there, if you'd like to have a retriever, it sure makes for a nice hunt. So bicycles at Grizzly, we get this question a lot. They are allowed. To, uh, for hunting, for waterfowl hunting only. So when you're fishing in the springtime or the summer, they're not allowed, but for waterfowl hunting, they are. A lot of people like to rig up a decoy trailer so you're not carrying that on your back. Um, and uh, converted child hauling apparatuses uh, are probably one of the most used items along with bikes. So no motorized bikes of any kind. This includes e-bikes. It's a very common question now because they are becoming more and more popular and attainable to more of the general public in price. Uh, this is our waterfowl hunt map. Any of the maps I'm gonna show on this, there are plenty at the waterfowl check station. So when you're there, you can ask for all these maps or you can uh, uh, call the office and we can arrange for that too as well. Really quick, uh, Orlando, this question came in. Are the goose, goose pits in field 13 going to be open this year? They are not. Uh, the field 13 is go on going through a major, uh, there was a fire in 2018. And so a lot of field 13 is being replanted and dissed and worked over at this point. So half, yeah, half of it will be open for pheasant season, but not for waterfowl on. Okay, so uh, reservations, you need to apply at least 17 days in advance. You can do it at that uh, link. And I know Sean said he's gonna send a lot of those out. Um, so something that's very different at Grizzly than other wildlife areas or uh, refuges that you hunt at, Grizzly does not have a parking lot. So uh, when a reservation, when you get a reservation, we don't use the numbers that are printed. We actually, it's still basically first come first serve. The Grizzly, when you drive in, there are two lines. The left-hand side is for reservation. The right-hand side is for sweat line or first come first serve. 
And that's going to be, you just line up in your vehicle. Um, and the reservations are good for two adults and each adult can bring two juniors or two non shooters So uh, if you, but in doing so, if you bring more than two people, you're not eligible to go to a blind. You have to go free roam at that point. <clears throat> so the, this is the kind of the specifics of hunting grizzly. Like I said, it's a type A. The quota is 350 individuals at one time. So what you get from that information is that grizzly is always available to hunt. We never fill up. And so if you have time in the afternoon to come hunt, I guarantee that you will have a spot to come hunt. So just keep that in mind. It is Saturday, Sunday, Wednesdays only, like most uh, type A areas or most waterfowl hunt areas in the state, or at least in this part of the state. Uh, the space blind, as I mentioned, are two, two person blinds. Pond 11 has 10 blinds. The Crescent unit has 18 blinds available. And the Crescent family unit has three blinds available. Like I mentioned before, they're junior required. And I'll say this, I always recommend that blinds, that you choose a blind if you're new to hunting, because uh, especially on the wildlife areas, because all the blinds have directional markers and they have reflective stakes that lead you directly from the levee to the blind. So it's a great way to get out there and not flounder around in the dark trying to find a spot to hunt. It, like I said, our stakes lead you right to the blind and, and, and take you the best path possible. These are the type of maps uh, that you'll get. You can see, tells you what parking lot to park in and which way to walk. And the way that map is, is how the stakes and, and directional signs are laid out on the ground as well. So very convenient for the new hunter. Here's our Crescent unit. You can see same thing, directional signs from different parking lots. And then this is actually a new unit we just added uh, last year. So um, still people are learning that, but another one that's available is part of the Crescent unit and basically sits just off of that other map. Oh, sorry. Crescent family, like I said, all these maps are available in the check station when, when you come down to, to hunt with us. Okay, so now that you've got your reservation, hopefully, or um, I'll also talk about if you don't have a reservation, but basically hunter processing begins three hours before shoot time, and, but it only does that on two days, op or two different events, opening weekend of waterfowl season, so Saturday and Sunday of opening weekend, and then the opening day of pheasant season, which is always the second Saturday in November, so three hours before shoot time, but all other hunt days, we begin processing hunters two hours before shoot. So what will happen is you're in your vehicle and a parking attendant will begin to move the line forward two vehicles at a time up to check station. You exit and approach the window and reservations are honored for one hour uh, up until one hour before shoot time. After that, basically you forfeited that reservation and you need to join the first come first serve line at that point. So the hunters will approach the window and through the plexiglass, because we are still using COVID protocols, and I don't see us going back to that, uh, going back to anything different, because it, we've made it a fairly smooth process at this point. So the hunter will be asked to show their reservation letter and hunting license and appropriate validations. Uh, you'll give the letter to the um, staff, and then also the day passes and everything else you're directed to. A check station staff will then issue your permit and you need to keep that with you while you are hunting in the field. Um, and the procedure is the exact same for the general first come first serve or what everyone usually calls sweat line. So you basically will be moved up and then uh, processed through in the exact same manner. The only difference is all the reservation holders will be processed first and then the first come first serve hunters will go next. So these are the documents that are required to hunt on grizzly. We're going to see that you have a valid Cal California hunting license. The type A pass, you do need to have. It is, you can get it in three forms, a one day, a two day, or a season long pass. And uh, those, the one day and two day will be taken from you. And obviously you'll keep your season pass at that point. 
California duck validation or California duck stamp, some people call them the federal duck stamp. It does need to be signed across the face in some fashion. And the HIP validation is a free validation you need to do uh, on your online um, purchase uh, the system. And then of course the upland game bird validation, but only if you're hunting pheasant, dove, or snipe on the wildlife list. So if you're not doing that, then you don't you don't need to have that with you at that time. So the blind draw on on the wildlife area. Uh, blinds are issued up to a half hour before shoot time. So at that time we cut them off and you won't be able to get to a blind. You'll have to go free roam if that time limit has run out. The blinds are first come, first serve. Uh, and the, there's a blind board hanging in the check station. Basically, you'll see if there is a chip that is flipped or not. If you can see the number, it's available. And so you can ask for that at that time, as long as it's within that time frame. We do have a noon blind draw for those of you that would like to come in the afternoon and hunt the afternoon. Uh, drawings held at noon, show up a little before that. We'll put your name on the list and then the drawing will happen. Um, but it's pretty simple. When the drawing's held you and your name's called, you pick from the available blinds. <clears throat> Excuse me. So afternoon blinds are issued between 12 and two. Same cutoff, once, that, once two o'clock hits, we do not issue blinds. If you miss that deadline of the draw at noon, you can still check in as long as blinds are available and it's between the 12 and two period. So even if that draw is complete at that time. Uh, really quick, Orlando, can I ask you a question regarding that? Yeah. Uh, first off, uh, I saw you mentioned the Upland game stamp required for dove. Are dove an allowable species out there? Um, they, they are. We do not hunt dove on the September 1st opener because we are hunting elk at that point. Mm -hmm. But we do hunt dove with, um, and I did address this in a later slide, but we do hunt dove concurrent with our pheasant season only on waterfowl hunt days. Uh, and then since you have a 12 o'clock uh, blind draw, is there a requirement for the early morning people to get out or that's just if they had vacated, you leave it empty until- Right, if, if, no, yeah, if you have a blind in the morning, it's yours for the whole day if you'd like it. But if people have come out, then that those uh, noon draw hunters can choose from those blinds. How about ADA blinds? Do you have any of those? We do. We have one ADA blind that is available. Uh, you can get a reservation for that as well. And if there is no one in that reservation and you have the proper documentation to uh, use an ADA blind, then you, we will refill that as well um, at any time. Like, uh, and then there was one last question I'd like to ask you is, uh, if somebody were to show up on a Wednesday afternoon, what's their possibility of getting a blind? Is Wednesday like a hard day or, or you know, I know Saturdays are more popular, but a Wednesday afternoon compared to a Sunday or something like that. Yeah, that, that's gonna depend on the weather and how we've been shooting, definitely. Um, obviously, if it's really good shooting, then yeah, probably potential to get a blind is, is good. If it's really slow shooting, potential is probably good to get a blind. But if it's average shooting and guys are hoping for the, you know, a little more birds, the blinds may still be full. So it, it just depends on the averages at that point. All right. All right. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so check in and check out times. We've talked about check in. Uh, check out basically the last time you can check in. So before daylight savings is 5 p.m. So if you show up before 5 p.m., we will let you on the wildlife area. Once daylight savings hit, 4 p.m. Is the, is the cutoff for when we will let you out. And then all hunters need to return to the check station um, and check out no later than one and a half hours after shoot time ends. So that's uh, generally not an issue. That's, that's quite a bit of time to get back to the check station and, and check out. And, th and that is a sideable offense, just so you know, if you're a constant person staying out in the field, you can be cited for that. <clears throat> so um, like I said, all hunters must return even if you didn't harvest a bird that's that's something we've had new hunters not uh, not realize is that um, we still need to see that a you're off the area for for safety in case you know people have had issues out on the wildlife area but also because no bird is also a data point of zero so 
we need to know that instead of wondering. And then basically the checkout is reverse. So the you drive up to the check station, the staff will come out and they do need to see your birds. So you need to show that to them. And you, so you're required to do that. And then you give us your yellow card back. The cards are yellow at this point. And we'll take those for you, write down your birds and then check you back into the computer system uh, at the end of the day. And then you're free to go from that point. So uh, some of the other hunting we've been talking about, we've kind of touched on some of this, but I'll, I'll do this again. Uh, So <clears throat> rabbit hunting has become pretty popular on the wildlife area. We do have, uh, this past season was a really good rabbit, uh, rabbit year for production. So cottontail and jackrabbit hunting is permitted on Grizzly Island, but the times it's not year round, even though jackrabbits are open year round in California on the wildlife area, we have certain times. So the month of July is open. And, and then like we mentioned before, um, same with dove, that concurrent with pheasant season um, and only on waterfowl hunt days, Saturday, Sunday, Wednesdays, you can hunt cottontail and jackrabbit. I think this year it closes on December 26, but that changes every year. So, uh, and the month of July, I will say that it is self-registration. You will just sign in at the booth and you can go hunt uh, cottontails and jackrabbits in, there will be a map there available for you. I didn't I didn't post it on this, um, but there will be a map available because it does change depending on uh, work that's going on or, or anything during that time. So same thing, you do need a valid uh, license, but you don't need a type A pass. Um, but during the winter season, when it's concurrent with pheasant season and you have to come through check station, even if you just want to hunt rabbits, you have to have that type A pass. Uh, pheasant and dove, so basically they open the second weekend in November every year and close the fourth weekend in December. And like we've talked about, you have to register at the check station, a valid license, upland game bird stamp, the hip if you're hunting dove because they are migratory. So that's what that, the harvest information program is about is migratory birds. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, on the third Sunday of November, uh, is a day where a lot of hunters like to come out and, and quote unquote clean up because on the day before that, on the Saturday, we usually hold our planted bird, uh, junior and family pheasant hunt. So uh, type B areas, I'll go through these pretty quick. A lot of the process is uh, very different here, but fairly simple. So the type B areas I mentioned before, Goodyear Slough, Island Slough, West Family, but junior required. Basically they have, I know this looks busy, but when it's, when it's in person, uh, all your information you need to fill out is there and there'll be this laminated at the kiosk. So type B areas are not staff. They are self check-in, check-out. Uh, basically you fill this card out and carry the, the lower portion with you. And when you're done hunting for the day, you return it to the kiosk and put it in the drop box with the upper half. Uh, you can leave the upper half attached to the, uh, the clipboard that is there. So the Goodyear Slough unit is a type B hunt area. Like I said, it's located uh, closer to Benicia on Highway 680 than, than Sassoon City. Uh, you have to have a season pass at, for this, for any of the type B areas, because like I said, they're not staffed. We, you cannot put a one day or two day pass in the drop box. The hunter quota is 40 individual hunters and there are 10 spaced hunt locations. They're, they're not blinds, but you need to hunt within the assigned area. The same thing, there are marked stakers with um, reflective stakes out to this area. And I forgot to take out the insert, the sign up sheet. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so this is the map of Goodyear Slough. You can see uh, it's right off of Lake Herman Road. And down at the southern half is the parking lot. And then the hunt area extends to the north from there. Island Slough, this one is located on Grizzly Island, just past the boat ramp, uh, Belden's boat ramp, if you've been on the island before. 
And like I said, same thing, type B area, uh, season long pass. The hunter quota there is 30 individual hunters. And this one's different, it's free roam only. So uh, basically make your way out and find a place to uh, hide and hunt from. Uh, here is the, you see the parking lot there on the Eastern side of the map. And uh, these maps are available. There's usually some there in the kiosk and you can grab one and head on out. The West family unit, like I mentioned, is junior required. Um, this one is uh, same thing, uh, 40 hunters. I don't know if that's correct. I think it's, anyway, that's some information. If I don't think that's correct off the top of my head, but it's in the kiosk. Uh, there is 10 space hunt locations. And a couple of the blinds are more than two per people. There is three blinds and there is a ADA blind as well that will allow for more than two hunters, up to three hunters at, at this location. So you could have one adult hunter and, and two junior hunters at, at, these, at this location for just those blinds. So at this point, I'll mention that, and here's the map for that, um, but I'll mention that all of these type B areas, they have a sign-up sheet. And basically you are allowed to wait in the parking lot beforehand. And so, but once you put your name on that sign-up sheet, you're not allowed to leave the parking lot. And there are some people that will stay the evening before to make sure that they get their spot that they want. So you can keep that in mind, but you do have to stay in the parking lot um, before you go. And you're not allowed to enter the field until two hours before shoot time. And that's standard um, on all of our units of the wildlife area. So that includes Grizzly as well. That's why we don't start letting people out until two hours before. So for this, I'm basically done. I mean, I know maybe people will have some questions, but I wanted to show some of the, um, the number of birds that get taken at each wildlife area. And so you can see that Grizzly Island being the largest, this was for last year, um, shot you know, just over 8,000 birds. So you can see that opportunity is there to uh, get your, take some, some birds home for the table. And then the other units are Joyce Island unit. <clears throat> I, I didn't mention that at this point. Honestly, I, I kind of ran out of time, but um, the Joyce Island unit is a special draw unit. It's only hunted on Sundays and you will, um, you have to get a reservation for that. There is no first come first serve and it only is 20 people every Sunday beginning in December. So the first Sunday in December is the opener and generally uh, it hunts pretty well because it has light pressure on, on that area. Uh, you can see Island Slough doesn't do too bad. The West Family Unit and Goodyear Slough Unit, Good, Goodyear Slough Unit as well. So, but here are the averages. You can see that even though Joyce Island shot less birds, the average is much higher. Um, and West Family does uh, quite well for being a junior unit that doesn't get hunted very often because most kids are in school on Wednesdays. So it, it gets used mostly on Saturday, Sunday. So these are some of the other opportunities we kind of talked about. Uh, we do have the Tule Elk Hunt. It's a apply through the online system and the deadline to apply is usually around the 1st of June every year. Uh, we do have a special Joyce Island wild pig hunt. It is shotgun slug or archery only. And <clears throat> the deadline to apply every year, I make the deadline the same, is February 14th. So Keep that in mind. Um, there's still time to apply for that one uh, coming up, obviously. And success at that one, be, same thing is limited. I mean, it's it's high because we only hunt for eight weekends in March and April, and you have two days to hunt. And uh, generally, you're allowed to take two wild pigs uh, if you can find them, which there are plenty of wild pigs on that on that point or on that on that property. Uh, and then we have uh, Grizzly Junior and Family Planted Bird Hunts. Unfortunately, the deadline to apply just passed for this year. But if you are interested, contact the main office because we do generally get people who, um, no, who, no. Yeah, who don't show or who cancel. Um, so you, you, we do have the ability to sign people up. Um, 
the 8 a.m. hunt is junior only, and then the 1 p.m. hunt is a family hunt. So, and family isn't defined. So you can, you know, is, if you're a new hunter, that's that's great. Um, other than that, um, right. that's, that's well, what I have. We still have some time uh, before I get hand it over to Carson, but there's a couple of questions that people really are asking about. Uh, small craft launch area and use of kayaks, is it needed? Is it one of those things that uh, uh, can be used out there, Orlando? So on the wildlife fair, the majority of it is weightable. Um, it, well, it's weightable. So chest waders, like I mentioned, you are allowed to have a boat per se on the wildlife area, but it does need to be less than eight feet. And it needs to actually mostly be used for, um, to be used for decoy transport. So uh, no kayaks, no big boats, just boats under eight feet. Okay. So that's like your little jet sleds and stuff like Orlando yeah. showed you his, uh, his little setup. You know, we use a game cart to put a little boat on to carry your equipment. All right. Um, some of the type B areas that you mentioned, are they open every day or are they uh, just uh, normal shoot days? Sorry, I, I did forget to mention that. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Uh, they are Saturday, Sunday, Wednesdays, just like everything else. Yeah. Okay. Saturday, Sunday, Wednesday. So who checks their permit? They just need to have it in the possession. And if they get checked, that that's, that's what they're Right. Healthy. Yeah, they need to have that on them along with their hunting license if they were to be checked by a uh, by a game warden. Okay. All right. Um, and the Type B season pass. Yeah, the season pass. Yeah, they need to have that on them as well. There's some other questions here that I think our staff will answer, or if once you're um, free here, Orlando, maybe you can address them uh, in our question and answer function. Right now, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Carson Odegaard with CWA. Uh, you can stop sharing your screen, Orlando. Yep. And we'll turn it over to Carson. Awesome. Let's get this going. Can you see that, Sean? Yep, it looks good. Perfect. All right, guys. Well, welcome to my end of the presentation. So like Sean said, I'm Carson Odegaard. I'm with CWA, um, and we actually have two properties that we own in the Susun Marsh that I'm going to be talking about. So the first one, oops, the computer's going a little slow. Let me go back. There we go. So first part, I'm going to talk about CWA. We are a nonprofit. So 501c3, we're based out of uh, Roseville, actually. We were founded in 1945 as the Duck Hunters Association of California. Um, so we just hit our 75th year last year. And then, as you can see, we kind of have evolved over the years um, through the 80s. And then towards the middle of the 80s, we realized that we need to start doing some waterfowl studies to determine uh, what's actually going on in the Pacific Flyway. And then all the way up into 2009, uh, we started the hunt program. And our main goal is to provide private land hunting opportunities to CWA members. So you actually don't have to be a member to apply for these opportunities, but if you are drawn, you do need to become a member and a membership for CWA is 35 bucks a year. It goes to a great cause. Um, and in our hunt program, we usually get over 3000 people a year out on our properties. So kind of an overview of California, you can see Grizzly Ranch and the Denverton um, arrows. Those are going to be the two in the Susun Marsh that we're going to talk about. We also have a couple properties in the Butte Sink up by Calusa, one in the California Delta, and then all the way down in the Tulare Basin, we have Goose Lake, um, and we hunt at all these properties. So Grizzly Ranch, if you're familiar with the Grizzly Island Wildlife Area, is literally right across the street um, from their Crescent unit. And then Denverton, if you've ever driven on Highway 12, going south out of Susun City, you'll see a Denverton um, road to your right, and it's right off Highway 12 right there. And you're stalling. I know my computer. There we go. So this gives you a little better overview. You got Fairfield up at the top, um, Highway 12 running down to Rio Vista. The orange is going to be Denverton. And that bright green is going to be Grizzly Ranch. And then that big um, yellow blob across the street, that's actually going to be Grizzly Island Wildlife Area. 
So CWA um, on our properties, our main focus is hunting and education. We've reached over or almost 300,000 folks um, through our education programs, our hunting programs, uh, anything like that. So this is our clubhouse at Grizzly Ranch. Um, and at Grizzly Ranch during the summer, we want, run youth camps. Um, we're always managing the habitat out there. It is a managed marsh. We have um, a manager that is out there always on a tractor when it's not hunting season, making it better for uh, the uses that we do. Uh, we have waterfowl hunting, which is what I'm going to talk about coming up. We do some outdoor education when hunter ed is allowed in person. Uh, we do some hunter ed classes out there. We also do wildlife education. There is a full sporting clays course, uh, and we used to let the public come out and shoot it a couple times a year. Um, and we had some instructor stations due to COVID. We haven't been able to do that, but we're hoping to bring those back. Um, and those happen during the summer. We also have a veteran fun shoot for uh, the military veterans that totally free. They come out, shoot the sporting clays course, um, and then we give them a lunch. Like I said, that didn't happen the last two years because of COVID, but looking forward to bringing that back in the future. So CWA hunt program, this is what I'm particularly in charge of. Uh, in the program, we have 50,000 acres through the state of California that we have access to and run hunts on. Um, over a thousand individual hunting opportunities that you can apply for, over 50 individual locations. And uh, like I stated before, over 3,000 people uh, per year get out on our properties or our uh, properties that donate to us to go hunting. So our um, hunt program back before COVID, we had a lot of hands-on mentored opportunities. We don't have those currently. We're going to look to bring those back. But what we do provide um, is a hunt that is tailored a little more to the beginner and the new hunter. Uh, if you are to get drawn at one of our properties, we will always provide you with a blind. There's going to be no free roaming, so you're always going to have a designated spot to hunt. We do provide decoys uh, in the blind for you. So if for some reason you don't have decoys and you want to try out hunting before you go and purchase them, we provide those for you. There's no free roaming on our property, so you don't have to worry about uh, your neighbor crowding in on you. They're set in as a designated spot. And then if you're really brand new and you don't have any waiters and jackets, we can provide those at some locations. Our two properties in the Susun Marsh, we can provide you with waiters and jackets. Really, all you would need to bring is a gun and shells, and you'll be able to come hunt. To apply for our program is $5. And then if you are drawn, we charge a $25 hunter access fee. You don't need any wildlife passes um, to hunt on our properties, but you do need the proper licenses. So here's our Grizzly Ranch property. You can see the yellow squares are gonna be the blinds that we have. Um, we have a big closed zone on the other side to hold birds. This is a boat property. We do provide you with a boat and we'll teach you how to use it. Um, so that blue lines that kind of reach those green squares are all of our boat channels. And we have tons of signage out there. We've never had anybody get lost. You just take it slow, follow the signs out in the morning. Um, and we do have an on-site coordinator there during your whole hunt, where if you have problems, you can call them. They will give you a rundown in the morning of the process of how the hunt is going to go throughout the day. So this is uh, just specifically Grizzly Ranch's average um, last year. So you can see most of our blinds are going to be averaging anywhere from three to eight birds per blind um, through the whole year, which is really, really good. We averaged a little over three birds per hunter throughout the whole year. Our main harvest is going to be green wing teal followed by northern shoveler. It's kind of going to be uh, the same throughout the whole marsh area. But you can see we do harvest um, a lot of ducks out at that property. So 1,714 was our total harvest last year out at Grizzly Ranch. This property is Denverton. Um, this is one that you can actually see off of Highway 12. So we, as you can see, we don't have as many blinds out here. We do have some tanks, which mean their blinds are in the ground. And we also have some floating blinds. Um, that's kind of like a giant floating tulip patch that you step into. So this property, uh, you walk to all the blinds, you can see the P4, P3, P2, and P1 are all the parking locations. And then the straight lines from there are all of the uh, walking paths to get you to the blinds. They are uh, 
labeled with reflectors. You fall the reflectors out directly to your blind. Blind six is our veteran ADA blind. We also have a veteran ADA blind at Grizzly Ranch. That means if you are a veteran, you are allowed to apply for that blind or if you are ADA, you don't have to be both veteran and ADA, you just have to be one or the other and you can apply for that blind. Here are the averages um, last year for Denverton. So we did harvest over a thousand birds uh, last year at Denverton. We had a little bit lower uh, per hunter average at 2.4, Grizzly was a 3.2. But as you can see, our average per blind was over five birds. So that's saying basically on any given hunt day, um, our average per blind. So if you're out there with two of your buddies, most likely the average you'll take home is going to be five uh, waterfowl, depending on the day and how you shoot. You could end up with zero. You could end up with limits. But we did average five throughout the whole season. Again, you can see green wing teal and northern shoveler are going to be uh, the majority of our take out there, as well as American widgeon. So the next few slides that I'm going to go through are going to be actually how you go in and apply for CWA hunts. Um, this is the CWA homepage. So if you were to type in cowwaterfowl.org, this is the very first page that you're going to get up. Um, you can join, donate, shop. Obviously, we're going to go into the hunting. Uh, we have the seasons and limits on there. So if you have any questions about what you can take and when the seasons are, we post those. We also have a veteran hunt program. Um, our Becoming an Outdoors Women program has been put on hold due to COVID, but we're hoping to bring that back. So you're going to click on the hunting tab, and then you're going to click on the hunt program. And that is going to bring you, if I hit it right, come on. The next page is basically going to be our main hunt program page, where you can find more information on each hunt that is offered. And the cool thing is on our new website, you can filter the hunts based on uh, what you'd like. So this is our hunt program page. If I were to scroll down on this page a little bit, you'll see all the hunts that we currently offer. Usually we include at least one picture. Sometimes we'll have more of those successful hunts. So you can kind of get an idea for what it looks like or what kind of their harvest is. And then it'll have a description of, um, what the hunt is about. So we have the Grizzly Ranch and Denverton ones on there. We also have some others. What you're gonna do is you're gonna click the apply login slash check results button. That's gonna bring you to the next page. Once I get this up and the next page is going to be where you're gonna enter your password um, and your username. So if you haven't gone into a uh, Cal Waterfowl's hunt program before, you're gonna have to enter your um, password or your email and you'll create an account and then you'll have an account login through the hunt program. There is a login on the CWA main website that you first get to on calwaterfowl.org. That is not how you log into the hunt program. It is actually through the link I just showed you. And you can see on the top that CWA.AspiraFocus, that's going to be the correct URL for you to get into the hunt program. Once you're in your account, it's going to look like this, which mirrors the states. Um, you're going to have your name, see my name, state ID, date of birth, and then you're going to see the apply for hunts button. When you click apply for hunts, you're going to get this next screen, um, and you're going to see waterfowl lottery hunts by region, Susun Marsh. And as you can see, we have obviously more than just the Denver tune and the Grizzly Ranch and the Susun Marsh. We do have private duck clubs that donate to us. Um, so you can see the Delta King and the family club. Right there, those are options that are in the Susun Mars that you can apply for that aren't CWA properties, um, but those properties are donated to us. So you can go out and hunt those clubs. For our purpose, we're going to talk about Denverton. Um, so you can see there's a little description of the property right there. And it says 105 available. That means there's 105 choices for you to select from. If you're to click on Denverton, this is the screen that's going to pop up. So you can see December 1st there, and then blind one, two, three, four, and five. So at Denverton, you're going to apply for a specific blind. So if you look on our averages and you say, hey, blind two is the best, I'm just going to apply for blind two, you can do that. If you want to apply for all the blinds, you're more than welcome. Each blind is its own separate lottery. And each time you check one of those boxes is $5. The only difference from here in Grizzly Ranch is that Grizzly Ranch has 
groups instead of blinds. And what a group is, is just an opportunity to come out and hunt. So we do the blind draw in the morning, meaning if you draw for group one, you'll show up in the morning, we will do another draw. And then if your group one gets picked first, you get first picks at blinds. And we will show you what blind is harvesting what birds before. So you'll have an educated guess on what you wanna pick. Um, Grizzly Ranch does have 10 opportunities per day. They have 10 groups you can apply for and each group is its own separate drawing. So if you just wanna apply for group one, that's totally fine. If you wanna apply for group one through 10, you'll be in the drawing 10 separate times. Our deadlines are a little bit different than the states. Um, CWA's deadline to apply is always gonna be the third Saturday for the month before. So it's kind of confusing talking about it, but basically if you want to apply for any hunt in December, the, the third Saturday in November is gonna be the deadline. If you want to apply for hunts in January, the third Saturday in December is going to be the deadline. We then run our draws one to two days after that deadline. And if you're drawn, you'll receive an automated email stating that you are the, now the hunt winner and you can go in and purchase that hunt. So like I said, the third Saturday of the month before is the deadline to apply. Within one to two days after that, we'll do the drawing for that whole month. So up here in a couple of weeks on the third Saturday in... Uh, September, or November, sorry, yeah. we will be drawing for all of our December hunts all the way from the 1st through the 31st. So you'll know way ahead of time if you have any, any luck. That should be the end of my presentation so I can stop sharing here. Perfect. <clears throat> so I just wanted to have uh, Carson present that as another option for people who are just getting into waterfowl hunting and this is soon Marsh and Grizzly Island area. They do have a great program. Uh, Pre-COVID, they had great opportunities to be mentored in the field. And that's a big part of waterfowl hunting is sometimes mentorship because it can be an intimidating sport to d dive into. And uh, you're, you're always best served with a mentor. Um, I see the staff has answered a lot of the questions um, that have come in. And uh, barring any other ones, uh, I just wanted to say thanks and tell you that this, this is, has been recorded and it will be made available to uh, you for future viewing. Uh, if you know anybody else who might wanna view it, please share it, uh, these opportunities with them. We have another webinar coming up on Thursday. Uh, if you haven't signed up for that yet, we are covering the North Bay San Pablo Bay and Napa Sonoma Marshes on Thursday night. Uh, you can register for that event at the same place you did for this one. Um, but the recording hopefully for this one will be out uh, later next week. So I do see some more. Oh, another question somebody wanted uh, discussed and, and Orlando, uh, you can probably cover this better. Uh, discussing rules and etiquette of, on free roam. Is there any particular rule or, uh, you know, what's, what's like how far a person must be spaced or, you know, how is somebody supposed to know whether they're okay hunting where they are? You're muted. All right, there we go. Um, I don't think that there isn't, there isn't a hard and fast rule. It depends on the cover a lot of times, but um, I would say, you know, 100, 150 yards away would be a good start. Um, and obviously a lot of hunters will let you know if you have encroached in that. And if you're, you know, if, uh, uh, if you're getting peppered, you know, shot raining down on you and it's a little closer than just, you know, you, you feel comfortable, then obviously that's another sign, but, yeah. uh, there's Grizzly Island, like I said, is a, a big acreage. So you do have the room to spread out. Yeah. I can tell you from my experience, because I started hunting on refuges, uh, be prepared to let people know that you're set up in a field by using a flashlight. We call it the flashlight boards. Okay. So you have a nice high power flashlight or a headlight and you wear it once you're in the field, set it up. So when you see approaching hunters that you let them know that, hey, there's somebody out here already. Uh, that really helps avoid the problem if you're asleep in the cattails and not aware that somebody else walking in on your pond, that's more likely when you're gonna result in these little 
wars that happen on out there in the refuge. Uh, the other thing is the refuge managers actually do a good job of trying to space where hunters uh, hunt because they will disc certain areas and leave certain tule patches at certain distances from each other, trying to mitigate this problem by having you set up in a tule patch that's far enough away from your other hunters. And you know, that leads to more, uh, I don't know, more sportsmanship out in the field. Um, other than that, yeah, 100 yards is probably a minimum that you want to set up for someone, but there really isn't a hard, fast rule on it. You know, if you're in a separate pond and you're separated by a big wave of a big swath of uh, cattails, and you're shooting a completely different direction than the other person is, uh, you could easily find yourself within 100 yards of someone else. But uh, the one thing that does happen out there is some people try to set up downwind of somebody else uh, try to steal their approaching ducks, and that's when we do have some troubles out there in the marsh. Uh, anything else that you want to add to that, Orlando? No, I think that's that's pretty good there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, so that's what we want to avoid. Uh, try to be out there safe and a good sportsman. Um, if you do have problems, don't confront somebody, call a game warden. Um, you know, we're not going to be referees in a lot of cases, but we don't want you having any fights because any type of um, incidents out there where you might have, uh, you know, physical contact with somebody could result in you being banned from the refuge for any future hunts for the rest of the year. So do not uh, engage in any type of activities like that. Um, that is about, yeah, I see about two questions here. Uh, we have heard of youth pheasant hunt, wild pheasants, any left, are there any wild pheasants left out on Grizzly Island? There, there are, um, you know, not like the golden age of pheasant hunting, but there are wild pheasants. We have hunters that hunt them pretty regularly. The pheasants do get pretty smart. They leave the upland fields and go to, yeah. uh, actually go and you basically hunt them amongst some of the areas where people are duck hunting. So, yeah. Yeah, somebody I, I saw asked the question, do you wear waders when you're pheasant hunting? I used to be a very avid uh, pheasant hunter on our wildlife areas, and I wouldn't wear waders because they're too hot and they're too expensive. You don't want to wear neoprene, you're going you're gonna to burn out. If you wear your, you know, your uh, breathables, uh, you're risking getting them torn. Um, I would just always figure you're going to get wet when you're hunting pheasants, and actually it's a nice cool down. So um a lot of that work is very hard you're going to sweat a lot uh but you do want to be around water if, to effectively hunt pheasants on wildlife areas you want to push them to water you want to cross water sloughs and get onto islands because any pheasant that has been flushed might land out there on a little island and that's where the birds are so um just expect to get wet wear some old boots and uh, i used to wear some rain pants that would help me keep the uh star thistles off me because those are annoying and they can affect your your hunt you have star thistle still orlando yeah there's a few areas of star thistle but yeah. we're not too bad it holds pheasants though so make sure you go through it carson what are the odds of getting selected for a hunt do you have anything on that front? yeah yeah um our susan marsh properties probably have the best odds uh just because the butane hunts are a little more desirable in people's eyes um Mid-November, we can see groups at Grizzly having as low as 15 to 20 applicants. Um, in prime time at some of our best properties, we can see up to 150, 200 applicants per group. Um, so depending on the time of the year, as well as the property, uh, it varies greatly, but your best odds at getting drawn on our properties are going to be Wednesdays, just like the state, because not everybody can hunt Wednesdays. Um, and then hunting a property in the middle of November um, when some people think that, hey, it might not be the best time of year to hunt. Uh, those will be your best bets on getting drawn. All right. Well, thank you, my uh, presenters, Orlando and Carson. I really appreciate you coming on and uh, giving all this information tonight. And uh, thanks for everything that you've done. Um, one last question, where can I find Deverton hunt results for prior years? I'm not sure if that's available, but try to reach Carson. Yeah, I uh, on our CWA hunt program site, 
if you scroll down to the Denver Tin Hunt, um, we do have, I believe it's a hunt data tab. Um, and we have graphs of uh, harvest data for the last almost 10 years now. So it's gonna be on CWA's hunt program website and you'll scroll down until you see uh, Denver Tin, you'll see a tab that says hunt data. Um, looks like another question about the North Ranch property that we have. Uh, I do not believe it was planted this year in rice due to the water shortage. So I do not believe we will have North Ranch um, like we did this year. I'm guessing once we have enough water and the rice gets planted for next year, we will be good to go. But for this year, North Ranch is out of the question. All right. Well, thank you again. Uh, we are going to close it off and hopefully I'll see all of you on Thursday night. Thank you, Carson, Orlando, and my fellow Hunter Ed staff and all you Hunter Ed instructors who have joined us tonight. Appreciate your following us. Uh, we have students out there that wish they could get your services. Uh, hopefully that will happen again soon. So thank you. All right. Good night.